Doc Rivers continues to time and time again not get it when it comes to getting... Oh! Let him play! He wins. Great steak. Smells like poop. Honestly, like if Urban Meyer wants to come to Connecticut, <laughs> bring him on. I mean, come on. I'll take him too. Nia Jackson, I think, weighs 280 pounds. Oh! Can we, can we isolate that clip? <laughs> Nia Jackson weighs 280 pounds. Oh! <laughs> Let her play. From Los Angeles, this is Dave in the City. Brought to you by Locks of the Week Radio. Now, here's Dave Medina. Good evening, sports fans! And a pleasure to have you here for the big NBA show. Good to have you with us from the Dave in the City studios in sunny Southern California. Sunny, still not that warm, though. It was, it's just kind of... It's been a very interesting spring, and it just hasn't been very warm in many places. Um, but uh, I got a little reprieve from that over the weekend. I was in Scottsdale. Just a little R&R, good times with a friend of mine. And uh, we're back and, and doing our thing. So let's let's get into some basketball. Two series, in, in two series to decide who gets to the NBA Finals. One of them wrapped up. The Golden State Warriors beat the Portland Trailblazers in a sweep. And the second series in the East for the Eastern Eastern Finals uh, still underway. In fact, we got a game going as we begin our recording tonight. Um, but the series going into today, it was the it was the Bucks leading the series two games to one. But the Raptors with the early advantage in the first half of the game as we talk on this program tonight. Chris and Georgia will will join us for all the particulars. And don't forget tomorrow we're going to have a we will have our PGA Championship recap with the golf fellas, John in Connecticut and Mike in North Jersey. So we hope you enjoy that tomorrow. But for now, we get into the meat of the playoffs as the finals the finals matchup starts to get more and more clear with every single game. Let's jump it. The NBA report for May 21st. So it's official. We have one end of the finals decided. No surprise, really. But uh, the manner in which it happened, uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise, and certainly um, a lot of disappointment along the way, but a lot of a lot of very exciting games along the way in the Western Conference Finals. And all the credit in the world to the Portland Trailblazers, who, even though they got swept, provided one of the most more exciting series you'll see in, in the West Finals. It's... A little surprising that they got swept in retrospect, but then when you look at who they had on the court, it's not really. I mean, they were shorthanded the entire way, so you got to give them a lot of credit. But, you know, the Raptors, I mean, the uh, the Warriors get it done. Kevin Durant did not play this series, not one game. They were down at least 15 points on three different games in a row. They they get, they had a def- they fought from a deficit in game 1 as well. So all told, the the Warriors had fought from behind in every single game of this four game sweep. They had fought from fifteen points down or more in, in every game since you know beginning with game two. One of them went to overtime, and they come out of all that with a four zero sweep. So that really shows you the resilience of that team, and that's where we're going to begin tonight. We'll get into the Milwaukee Toronto series later. Um, as we get into really, you know, the very end of the season, uh, for, as far as we're con- as far as we know, some coaching news will break down a little bit later on. More drama from the Lakers. Uh, don't don't you worry, fellas. We we will get to that too uh, near the end of the program. So let's ring in Chris. Chris, it's been too long. How's it going tonight? Great, Dave. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. And, and I mean, you know, it's even though it's only been a week, it's it's nice to get into this. I teased that we might not do a show tonight, but since one of the series clinched, and since we've got some juice in the second series, um, to an extent, um, it's, it's it's a good time. To, it's good to do a show anyway. I think we can space out some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Um, and and now and I I think it's as far as the West Finals, it's one of the most interesting four game sweeps that you will ever see. Okay, normally when there's a four game sweep, it's one team completely dominating the other team much like the Boston Bruins did to the Carolina Hurricanes in the NHL just a, just a few days ago. But here, 
you had four games in which the Warriors trailed every single one of the games. And and but it took different people stepping up each night to win these respective games. But Steph was definitely a huge part of it. And uh Draymond Green, maybe not necessarily in the scoring, but he was getting it done on the defensive end. It is very obvious that he has worked hard to regain some of his, his original form because he looked washed up. We were even talking about it a few months ago. Like we thought he was he thought he was over the hill. But he had regained some of his past glory for a couple of games. So it's really incredible. Um, that's about all I got to say about this series. Damian Lillard just played like crap the whole series. And I continue to speculate about his health. I don't think he was 100%. I mean, I know. I wouldn't say I know. But I'm like 99% sure he was not 100% for the series. They didn't have Nurkic for the entire series. And that hurt him. I think that was the reason why I think the Warriors were able to beat them, and they, and that's why the Blazers kept blowing all those leads. They didn't have the length, and um, and this is a team that the Warriors can can get by without. Well, they're, basically, they're basically without the length that um, we've been accustomed to. At least, no, I mean, I guess their length is fine. But ugh, sorry, I'm rambling about it. But the the point of it is, the Blazers, with what little they had in personnel, were able to make the most of it. And there's a guy, Chris, you remember the guy, uh, Myers Leonard? I mean, he came out of nowhere and had a huge first half yesterday in game four. Um, so a lot of different unsung heroes stepped up in the series. And for a game, for a series that ended 4-0, it's probably one of the more entertaining series you will see in the NBA playoffs. So, uh, uh, again, now I am definitely done with having anything to say about it. Uh, I'll leave it to you for your thoughts. Yeah, a couple of things, um, and you kind of hit on this. One, the it was it, this is one of those series that you'll look back and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, Portland got swept, and you won't unless you really examine it, you won't realize how close the series was for a sweep. Um, Portland actually led more minutes in this series than the Clippers did. I think it was like one hundred one to eighty three in terms of minutes where they led, yeah. which is shocking. <laughs> and I think in every single one of these games, like I just, I never felt like Golden State was out of it. Like, And last night was no different. I just felt like um, they were going to come back. And, you know, d- despite a valiant effort from Myers Leonard, who scored, I think he scored 25 in the first half, something like that, which was a career high. And he, he matched that in the first half. Uh, I just felt like the uh, the Warriors were going to be too much for them, and they were. Um, yeah, the the Draymond thing has been fascinating, and uh, he, yeah, the, you're you're seeing the shades of the old Draymond. I mean, he still is not shooting like he used to from the perimeter, and he shot, I think, twenty eight percent from three uh, during the season, and he shot 25% during the series, although he hit a huge three last night. Um, so that part of his game hasn't returned. But, uh, the yeah, the game that impressed me the most, and it was in game three where he had the triple-double. He had 20 points, I think 13 rebounds, 12 assists, and uh, really was the you know the hero of the, of the game. Um and and really, Clay has looked a lot better too, and he's taken more of an active role in, in the team, in my opinion. Uh, he averaged twenty one points per game in the in the series. His shooting percentage was down, but he also was very key as, as a defender uh, in, in in the series. And also, I, 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 one thing that you you also touched on was that uh, that Lillard was hurt, and um, I think it was. In the during the last series, where he, I, I think he hurt his hamstring, and then someone fell on him. Was was that in the Denver series? I'm trying to remember now. I feel like it must have been. It might have been one of their bigs fell on, on Lillard, and it looked like he hurt his shoulder. Uh, and yeah, I, I totally agree. Something just wasn't right. We weren't seeing the same guy that we're seeing uh, during the Oklahoma City series, and he. And it showed. I mean, he shot under forty percent overall, and uh, just really was uh, just uh, 
a, dis- a big disappointment. But as a whole, though, it was not a disappointment. I, I, people, I think, overreact to these like, oh, it's so embarrassing for for the Trailblazers get swept. And it's like, well, you know, you're facing one of the all-time great teams. And even without KD, it's still, you know, this is still a fantastic team, incredibly talented. Um, one thing I do like to see, though, is I feel like the ball movement is a lot crisper. There's, like, more passing, less iso ball without KD. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, I mentioned it last time. It's kind of like you're watching the old Warriors again. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been, ha- I've actually kind of been having fun with this team and just kind of enjoying it. Last night was, was really entertaining, even though I, I mean, I sort of like the, the Blazers. Uh, it, it's been fun catching up and watching, watching the Warriors do their thing and, and be the old Warriors again. Yeah. And, and I, I do, and again, I, I think it's an easier team for a lot of fans to root for. Just because it feels like it doesn't seem like it's so much a, such an overwhelming advantage for for Golden State, but beyond that, you you broke down a lot of this. It's it's just a more entertaining team to watch when KD's not there. But having said that, I mean this is they need him in order to win the finals. Like I don't think they're gonna. I don't. I would have a tough time seeing them win the NBA Finals against either Milwaukee, maybe against Toronto, but against Milwaukee, I'd have a tough time seeing them win the finals without Durant, because you need the matchups. You need the matchups there, and I think they're a small team without him. They really do. I, I mean, I mean, you can get Bogut in for a couple minutes, but his shelf life is not very much this deep into his career. I mean, Kevon Looney is fun. You know, McKinney's fun. but And Draymond has always been undersized his entire career, too. I mean, he's a tough guy, but he's never been the tallest guy, you know, on the court. So Never. No. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> I don't know how you're going to match all of that against Giannis Antetokounmpo. That that's what's where I where I'm at with that. So I feel like Kevin Durant would give them would would at least make that make that defense a little bit better. Um, and you can do it. I'm just saying it's just going to be much, that much tougher. So uh, I, that's what makes it so much more dramatic. I think losing KD is almost like a boost for the playoffs in a bizarre way. Like, it's actually made it more entertaining. Because you're, you, you're wondering, like, can they respond without him? And Kerr did a tremendous job just getting the most out of everybody, even guys that you never heard of, like, just just stepping on the court and all of a sudden getting minutes. Uh, it was just, it was fun to see that. Like, and then how did Stotts react to that? And how did they build a big lead? And then how does Kerr re- respond to that? How did, how did Steph respond to that situation? And then what's the answer for Portland? Portland never really went away. Like, even... When they seemed down and out at the end of Game Four, they were still fighting. They forced overtime, and they they had to go through overtime in order to have that game decided. So, you know, I think it says good things about the Portland Trailblazer. What's the word? Mentality, attitude, attitude. Yeah, the attitude is the word. Um, and it's just a shame that we'll never really know what this could have been like if all those guys were healthy. You know, Nurkic healthy. Um, was there anybody else? I mean, there's a, uh, I mean, obviously Lillard, but I, if there's anyone else, let me know, Chris. But I just think it it just set up the Blazers well for the next first couple of years, and I did not think that this team with McCollum and Lillard together would be a long term thing, but it could be. I'm not familiar with where the contracts are, but it could work. They just got to get some additional help on the bench, and if Nurkic is healthy, that that will definitely open things up. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, Nurkic was the, was the big one, and it, they really missed him. Even though they got some good effort um, throughout the playoffs out of, uh, well, I mean, last night was Myers Leonard game, but um, but out of uh, Cantor, especially d- during the first round against Oklahoma City, and he was even he was kind of banged up. Um, I'm trying to think of other injuries uh, that was that was. I mean, Nurkic was the big one though, because he, you know, he's really was the low post presence for the team all season, and uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. But, but you know, they'll be back, and they're, you know, they have, you know, still that elite backcourt, and um, and Nurkic, and you know, maybe they can pick up a wing or two in the off season. I don't know. I mean, uh, 
but guys stepped up and 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 helped them along and that was it was you know it was a fun team to watch and i'll always remember the oklahoma city series that was highly entertaining and uh but yeah i mean getting back to draymond i just it's so funny like i I, I think about Draymond as like one of those guys who you kind of hate if he's not on your team, but if he's on your team, you'll love him. And, you know, you just kind of like if he's on your team, you kind of look past the foolishness and like kicking LeBron in the groin and all that. Um, but he's such a smart player and he's so sound. I mean, he's just a really good defender. He's a great passer for a forward. Um, he can kind of do everything except shoot right now. And, uh, and he, you know, I feel like he's kind of proven to be a leader. Maybe he's matured a little bit. He made some comments after game three about how he was just kind of, you know, stuck in this point where he was always complaining about the refs and it just wasn't helping his game. And, and, uh, I thought that was an incredibly mature, uh, thing to say. And, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm kind of, you know, it's, it, like I said, is his stats are up in the off season or especially in this series, he's averaging like 16 points per game with KD out. And I almost feel like of all the players who on that team, I mean, I, I don't know this, but I, I, you know, I just, I go back to when they had that big fight on the, on the, on the court side and uh, it was KD and, and, um, and uh, Draymond, and they were going at each other. And Draymond was the one who brought up the contract and how it was a big distraction. And I really feel like he's kind of the guy who's really had to kind of put his game on the back burner. And now he's showing you again who he is and what he's capable of and who he was before KD got here. And um, so it's 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 been a lot of fun. And, and then you mentioned two guys who also stepped up, McKinney, um, and especially Looney. I mean, Looney made some huge plays down the stretch last night in regulation and uh, just some big rebounds and some really top-notch defense. And uh, I love stories like that, man. He was like a late first-round pick and uh, really has, has fit in nicely. And it just, it just shows you uh, how good teams can draft. And, um, I mean, McKinney wasn't even drafted, but – you know, Looney was like, I think he was 30 pick in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, Draymond was a second rounder. I mean, this is why good teams are good. Uh, they just, you know, they draft extremely well and they, um, and the Warriors have done that. That's why they're one of the best run organizations. So, uh, but I, I, the Draymond story is one that I just, I, I, I don't know why I kind of eat it up. And, um, so I'm, I'm enjoying it for, from that aspect a lot. It is kind of neat to see some of these classic guys, and I say classic meaning the pre KD uh, core of this team get some prominence again. Because it didn't it really feel like like everybody, all those guys got sh- shoved, I mean, shoved into the uh, the side of the stage when he got to the team. And, and it's not anybody's fault. It's just that that's just what's going to happen when the arguably the best player in the NBA this year goes to your team. Like he's going to be the dude, and everybody else is like the guys who help the dude. Um, so that was, it is a bit of a moment of redemption for a lot of those guys. And I, I think I see your point on that. Um, but, um, you know, no, there's no, but that, that's, that's a, that's pretty much how I feel about it. And, um, I, I do have to give them a lot of credit, even though you would think, wow, ah, but they still have all these talented guys. Like it shouldn't be that difficult, but it can be because it's just, you have to completely change the way you do your offense and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, I'm, I think it was a, relatively interesting series for what well, for what it was i mean a four game sweep isn't going to be great but but the individual games certainly were pretty good and uh, i got a lot out of it i just thought that the the thing what my more than anything i think that the blazers showed me something these playoffs cuz i was way down on them you remember this i was way down on them throughout the course of the season i was scarred by the many short lived playoff runs that they had had previous to this year but this year they really put things together, and, and, and oddly enough, it happened with them shorthanded. But I think it speaks well to the coaching. Terry Stotts has done a remarkable job with matchups for many of these games. Um, I can't, I can't really defend him blowing fifteen point leads three games in a row. That I don't know how you defend that, but, <laughs> but.
but uh, maybe that just proves how shorthanded they were. I mean, do you give him a pass on that, Chris? I, well, I just, you know, and that's something I tried to hit on my opening point, is just that it it's not even a pass. It's just like it, we're, we're seeing one of the all-time great teams. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, this team is, you know, it's going to be, you know, this – be remembered with the 60s Celtics, with the 80s Lakers, you know, even with the the Jordan era Bulls. I mean, it, this is this is a classic team, arguably maybe the best team of all time, and uh, they're not done. And I, you know, I think they have another championship or two in them, maybe more than that. So um, that's why I I just can't get crazy, even though it was a 15 point lead at the half or, and all that. Um, you know, I can't, I can't kill Portland. Uh, one thing I, I should mention, and I, you know, we talked about Loney, um, Kavon Looney, and and uh, McKinney. But, you know, the Warriors were were really shorthanded too. I mean, of course, we know that Boogie has been out for, uh, you know, he's out for the playoffs. But uh, and KD, we already mentioned, but they were also about Iguodala, so they were really shorthanded. Um, in, in, in the course of the series and, and especially last night and uh, and they and they prevailed um, just want to just double check the box score because I want to see how many players actually they, they did go a lot deeper than I thought but um, even Andrew Bogut chipped in two minutes but uh, but really you know your you know your most important guys went um, actually no I'm looking at the wrong box score sorry just look at this uh, game four, but, um, but really, uh, you know, guys stepped up and that's the mark of a good team. And like, like Looney was kind of a hero. He played almost 30 minutes last night um, off the, off the bench. And, uh, and that's what good teams do is they're able to fill in when, when, uh, when they face adversity. So, uh, but yeah, I can't kill, I can't kill Stotts or Portland or anything like that. And I, I, I'm kind of anxious to see what uh, what's in store for that team. Yeah, I think if they can augment this this roster with some good some good help, um, I'm not sure what specifically they need to do. I I mean I thought that maybe obviously a rebounder would be great, so getting Nurkic back would help. But maybe more length along the front court would be would be a good asset. Somebody like that. I mean, they did actually have some pretty good guys. I mean, Evan Turner made some nice plays, and uh, Rodney Hood did too. But those guys can only do that in limited minutes. You need, like, maybe more more dependable guys that can be in there longer. Um, so that's along the lines of what we could, what they, they could do to, to help that team. Um, obviously, the, the issue of uh, who's the closer, not a problem with this team. I mean, it's either going to be McCollum or it could be Lillard, and, and I think that's just fine. And uh, assuming that Lillard gets healthy... And assuming that he was unhealthy to begin with, and I think he is, um, and then if he gets healthy and they do this again, they get back to the playoffs. It could be an exciting time for the Blazers. So, yeah, I think you could. I think you could say that it might be tough right now for the Blazers fan, but after a few days, I think they're going to come out of this looking like saying, "Hey, you know what? We challenged these guys. We had a good playoffs, and I think that's a big improvement over last year, where they were completely humiliated by the Pelicans." Yeah, for sure, and and um, I can't. What were the seedings? I can't remember. Was Portland? It was a three six, if I could remember correctly. Three. It was it was three six. That's right. I thought they were the three seed behind uh, behind Houston. One other interesting note. I mean, since we're sort of bordering on the plate Blazers and their off season and sort of where they need to go, a um, little rough in the in the cap area because uh, um, for next year, let's see, they are fifth. In as it stands right now, and just total committed contracts for 2019-2020. Um, so they are, um, you know, they don't have a lot of uh, wiggle room. I think the cap is right at a hundred million. Um, so obviously they're over, uh, but I can't remember where the, uh, you know, where the luck, you know, the, where the tax comes in I, I, it might be around 130 i forget but at, at any rate they don't have a lot of wiggle room and and one of the bad contracts is evan turner and he's making 18 million comes off the books after 2019 2020 so 
things will get a little roastier there. The the real bargain though is Nurkic. He made eleven million, uh, and then twelve million for the next two years, and then there's a I think there's a player option on twenty one twenty two. So um, so they'll be looking a lot better after that. But I I think they really just need wings and and the ability to um, you know to just a little bit more scoring options outside of their two guards. Uh, but once getting Nurkic back will certainly help a lot. Oh yeah. I mean that, that's just a lot of questions answered with one guy. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a good wrapper for the Western conference. And I think, I think another indicator that the uh, West is the deeper conference and the better conference. I mean, you saw that there wasn't really an easy out during any of these series. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think. Was there any series during that? I mean, there might have been one, I think, um, in the first round. But I never even count the first round in that because, like, all the first <laughs> round, as we know, there are teams in the first round that don't belong in the playoffs. But but even in the West, too, the first round was was good. Like, we had the Clippers giving the Warriors all they could handle. We had, uh, let's see, with Denver, who were they playing? Denver played the Spurs. That was you know, like series went. That was the only one that went seven, I think. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So that yeah, that one was pretty so tough. That was a good series. Was a tough yeah. fight. Yeah. Um, the and, only, uh, yeah. Let's see. The only one that sucked was like Houston against Utah. Like Utah was just horrendous. Like that, I couldn't wait for that one to be over, and it it, it was. It didn't take long. <laughs> they finished that one pretty quickly. But um, other than that, the other three series were pretty good. So yeah, I think yeah, you're right. I totally agree. I totally agree. The East was. Uh, there was there was a little juice with the two um, Eastern Conference teams, the Sixers and the and uh, well, actually, yeah, the Sixers and the and the uh, Raptors both losing Game One, but then they came back and and won the next four in each case. So, but yeah, it was it was I mean for a first round it wasn't bad. I, I can't complain. But the second round, of course, as we were talking about last week. Um, it was just fantastic. Like that's the best round of the playoffs, and it's probably gonna be. Although I, I do think that the finals could have all the makings, especially if the Bucks finish the deal. But they are trailing at the half in Game Four at Toronto, sixty-five to fifty-five. Game Three, the Raptors won, going to double overtime. But from the sound of it, from what people were saying after the game. It really seemed like Toronto was fortunate to win. It just seems like they were doing everything <laughs> not to win, and, but they still won anyway. So uh, let me get your, th- your 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 overview of the Eastern Conference Finals so far. Yeah, it, you're you're absolutely right about that. I mean, they, I mean, Giannis fouled out in in uh, in overtime. Um, actually, a bunch of I think Middleton did too, and and uh, on Toronto side, Lowry. Lowry fouled out. Um, it was it was tight, very incredibly tightly called um, game, and um, they were able to force Giannis into eight turnovers. And it was just kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like if if you want to really beat Giannis, you you got to have the refs helping you out. And I don't mean that in a, you know in a sarcastic way. I just feel like Giannis is one of those players, much like LeBron, where um, you know what he does on both sides of the court could honestly uh, be called either way. I mean, you could um, often he gets a favorable favorable whistle, but uh, certainly he could be called for charging quite a bit, um, and you know, and on the defensive side as well, he could be called for blocking fouls. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was um, it was it was you know it was an interesting game in, in overtime. Um, he, uh, Kawhi uh, made this left-handed dunk, and um, and then when he came down, he kind of clutched his uh, his quad and really looked a little gimpy after that. Um, stayed in the game, but um, I think you know that's like kind of an injury that's bothered him in the past, and um, yeah, I wonder. You know, I mean, tonight he he had a really rough start uh he, he's one for five shooting 20 percent over three and uh, uh you know i gotta think that's affecting him somehow the bucks are winning by 10 at the half i mean sorry not the bucks the the raptors excuse me are winning by 10 at the half 
in spite of the fact that Kawhi is uh, is you know really not having his his best game, um, and you know, and also Siakam has has been kind of a non entity in this game too. Uh, really, Kyle Lowry's kind of set the pace, which he he did earlier in the season, uh, in the series rather. I think in game two he had thirty. Um, so, yeah, so it, it was. It's you know, it's been an interesting series. I mean, the Bucks, even in losing game three, I, I just they just look like such a they they just look like the better team. Uh, and um, I don't know. I'm, I'm as I watch this, I'm just kind of. Got it on in the background. I just I, I don't feel confident that this ten point lead is is gonna is gonna hold up just because unless you know Kawhi really gets going uh, in in the second half, I just I feel like they're you know um, you know it's like Norman Powell is, is you know has to be a big contributor and and uh i i don't know that uh i don't know that this team can can do that without their star uh leading the way uh but yeah it's you know it, i feel like you know i i, I don't want to bury the um the raptors but i feel like um i'm i'm kind of ready to to see milwaukee golden state i want to see <laughs> I, I and I, and i sort of you know in spite of myself i sort of want to see kd in there uh, going against Giannis and and just see that matchup, I think it'd be really exciting. Uh, but yeah, I mean it's you know it's this is uh, it, it's been fun. I mean I I think um, I do I I still think Milwaukee's going to win tonight though I really do and I think they'll win the series. Oh, the other interesting point this is just a general thing is like, and and you're talking about the opening of the show how um, you know maybe we don't do a show this week but. What's interesting is like so. Let's say Milwaukee wins tonight, and then Game Five would be um, Thursday night, Thursday night eight thirty. And if Milwaukee to win that, and that's in Milwaukee, we have seven days without NBA because <laughs> the next game, the first game of of yeah. of the finals is May thirtieth. Right, right after they didn't want to start it. Over you know Labor Day week or sorry Memorial Day weekend, and uh, so yeah we're, we've got I mean the Warriors are off for nine days <laughs> as it stands right now so yeah be interesting to watch I and and from that standpoint I hope this series goes seven I want I don't want to have that much of a layoff man yeah Kawhi is really limping right now Ooh. I mean he just looks he looks super gimpy right now well therein lies the uh... The drawback of having Kawhi play so hard for so many minutes and having nobody help him, he's trying to he's trying to throw everything he has into this in this series and and uh, he he doesn't turn it he doesn't dial it back and and that's good it's a good thing but the problem is sometimes it leads to injuries and and it sounds like that's what we got right now. Um, I have honestly not much to add at all to that. I will only say that I agree with you in, on two fronts. Number one, you're, you're calling Milwaukee to win. I agree with you. I think they're going to win this game tonight. Number two, you've also said that Milwaukee has had full control. I mean, not full control, but pretty much had control of the series. And you always felt like in every game, much like with Golden State in their series, that they had a chance to win this game and they were never out of it. And I agree. Oh, he really is. Getting, man, I'm looking at the replay. Yeah, he's really, really hurting. Uh, Kawhi is. Yeah. Yeah, but but just it's very similar. I I feel like Milwaukee doesn't isn't threatened really for the in terms of like their ability to win the series. I don't feel any drama there. I feel like they have complete control. Even if they lose this game, they got Game Five at home. They win that, and then they and, you know they could even win Game Six. Like I don't even think I don't even know. I mean, I would give Toronto like a three out of ten chance of. Forcing a game seven. That's just forcing the game. I'm not even saying win the series. I'm saying force a game seven at all. And that's that's just where I'm at. Like I just through consistently we have not seen the help. We have had a good game from Kyle Lowry tonight. He's shooting pretty well. We have had occasional good games from Siaka. We've had occasional good games from great from other people on the roster. But it's not happening consistently. The only guy that's been the the constant 
for this team is is Leonard. And if he's hurt like he is right now, I I, I would have said this even if he wasn't hurt. I just feel like the the odds are still against Mil- against the, the Raptors. I mean, this is too much length, too much too much outside shooting. There's too many good players on the Milwaukee side for them to get by and win this series. And I think it's a disservice to the Lionels if they do win. I'm just gonna be, I'll just take it that step much further because a team with that little production from everybody from the rest of the roster, I mean, Golden State's going to eat them up. They don't have like I said this all year. They don't have the length to compete with teams that have big players. And if they go up against the the, the Warriors and they have Durant, I mean, I don't know if they win a game. I don't know if they would win a single game of that series. So that's as far as I can go with the Eastern Conference Finals. And from that standpoint, I am very similar to you where I'd rather just Milwaukee finish this thing early. Yeah, uh, that, and you raised a really good point about, about the length. And, and that just reminds me, Milwaukee's a huge team. Mm-hmm. I mean, like they can go, they can put out a lineup where, you know, they put Brogdon at point, who's 6'5. You know, they've got Giannis, who's, you know, who's like seven feet tall, basically. Um, he's 6'11. Uh, they can put, you know, um, uh, Chris Middleton, who's 6'8. I mean, they could put and then have, uh, have Brooke Lopez, who's over seven feet, and um, and also uh, um, who am I missing? Uh, Did you mention Miritich? Is he kind yeah, of Miritich? I mean, Miritich is huge too. That, that's exactly what I was thinking of, and and Miritich is uh, how tall is he? He's like six eight, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, yeah, at, least like six, six, at least six seven. So yeah, six eight. Okay, six eight. Okay. I think he's six eight. Uh, let me just double check that. No, he's six ten. He's wow, 6'10". even so, bigger. So Dave, I mean, that like that's a seriously huge lineup. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I think you're you're totally right. That that that. that I mean, it's just. Yeah, I mean. Um, yeah, they don't. They really don't have the size to match up. That and that 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 actually is something interesting, too, to look at if uh, if it does come down to Milwaukee, uh, Golden State, which I think it will. Um, is just what impact does height have on that series, if anything? Because, um, you know, like you know, we talk about Golden State and like you know they kind of brought small ball to the NBA and. And they did, and they, they've been successful with that. And, you know, they have that death lineup, and Draymond plays center, and he's 6'7", you know, and, and not, not a lot of guys can do that. Um, but, you know, Milwaukee's a different beast in the sense that, you know, they can – they have this monster in the middle who just kind of, you know, who can kind of run all over the floor. And then they have big guys like Miritich and and – Brooke Lopez from the outside who can shoot the lights out. And it's just, there's serious mismatch problems there. And I, I, I'm, I don't know. I want to see how Golden State um, does that. And, and and especially in light of the fact that, you know, I mean, Giannis is, uh, you know, Giannis and KD are like probably the two toughest matchups in the NBA at this point in time. And, uh, I don't know. I, th- I think it'll be they present a real challenge for Golden State. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm going to add one more advantage that they have. If the regardless of who wins this Eastern Conference Final, the winner of this series is going to have home court advantage over the Warriors. I don't think a lot of people know that yet, and the reason is because in the standings, the Warriors finished with 57 wins. That's a very good year, but. Not for, but for them, that's usually a year where they usually they win like sixty five, and that's because they were so up and down throughout the regular season. And meanwhile, in the East, you had the Bucks just having a great year, a lot of rubble in the East too, so that's why they were able to get so many wins. And Toronto has fifty eight wins, so they would have home court advantage as well if they had won that if they win this series. So that's a dynamic that. That doesn't really matter for the Warriors, but it will add a lot of interest to Game One, where I think that the Bucks would have an amazing opportunity. 
Yeah, definitely. Gosh, I did not realize that. I wasn't even thinking about that, that Toronto would have home court as well. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It is interesting because I I wasn't sure. And I was thinking about it like, well, you know, Toronto, I mean, sorry, well, Golden State was losing all these games. The Warriors were losing to the Suns. They lost to the Lakers on Christmas. And they had a bunch of letdown games. I'm like, I wonder if they have enough wins to get home court advantage in the series. And I'm like, oh, man, they don't. So, uh, you know, again, that doesn't scare them. We saw last year they didn't have home court advantage against the Houston Rockets, and it mean it really didn't mean anything. <laughs> Game seven on the road, they were fine; it didn't matter. But uh, but it's still, I think, one more advantage you would give to the the underdog in this series, and they're going to be an underdog because of the legacy of the Warriors. But if you look at the rosters, it does seem like that the the Bucks in a vacuum could be a better team on paper. Definitely, I mean, and and. You know, the stats kind of bore that out. I mean, they were, in terms of uh, net rating, I mean, they were far, far better than everyone. And I I can't remember. I, I remember hearing this. That if you look at that stat historically, they were, you know, the all-time greatest team, which is crazy. So uh, it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, but, I mean, you mentioned the difference in talent or maybe there's, you know, some bad teams in the East and, uh, you know, there's probably some to that, but I, I still think uh, I, I, I don't. I think this is legit. I think they're. I think they're really, really, really good, and and uh, they'd be a challenge to anyone. So I'm I'm excited, man. And, and plus, you know, like I said, uh, it. Um, you know, either way, we're seeing two new. You know, we're seeing one new team in the finals. This is not. We're not seeing LeBron against the Warriors again, which is which is a nice nice break. Something the NBA needed, and uh, be great to see you know the, their young star in, in the finals. I couldn't agree more with that, and I I don't think I think a lot of casual fans or casual people, or casual observers, even guys who don't follow sports, are killing the NBA for the low ratings. It's ah oh, well, they don't have LeBron, and and then the comment by Adam Silver today was a little unusual. He was saying because LeBron, the best player in the NBA is not in the East, they're, they're getting killed in the ratings for that. Like, why is that a problem? Like, I don't think, or no, I think he said something like, he may have been making a point about, um, no, no, that was it. I think that was a comment. And I'm like, but that's never been a problem for the NBA before. LeBron played most of his career in Cleveland and Miami. They're not great TV markets. And I don't think that was a problem for the ratings. So I don't think using the market makes a sense to me. Like I, I think if you're if you got a great player in the NBA, you're gonna get eyeballs. It's it's really simple. And I think they, I agree because this has been a. I agree with the people on Twitter who have been complaining about the NBA not giving the Bucks enough promotion. And I think that is a very very fair thing to to criticize them for. This has been a problem for as long as I can remember. They don't give Milwaukee any publicity. I mean, they're giving Cleveland and Orlando, they're giving them, like, they're giving them, like, promotional uh, juice in the ads and the promos and the games and everything. But it just doesn't seem to happen for Milwaukee. And I realize that the TV ratings for anything with Milwaukee involved are bad. I I get it. But I'm surprised that they haven't done more to promote the Bucks and specifically Giannis. Like, I thought they would be doing more than they're doing. Seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? I yeah. mean, especially this guy is more than likely going to win the MVP, and uh, yeah, it just seems like a you know it, it would it seems like it would be an easy sell too, especially as the season progressed. It would be um, you know it'd be be a, wouldn't be tough to market this team. It's 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 funny because it's inconsistent. Like I don't, they never had problems promoting teams in small markets before, you know, when Shaq and, and Penny Hardaway and the old arena was go, were going back at, you know, like 25 years ago. Can you believe it's been that long? But uh, it's 25 years ago. <laughs> they, they were all over it. They, I mean, you, you, could not, you could not go like 10 seconds without hearing about the Orlando Magic and how they, they were the next big thing. And then Jordan came back and squashed that. But, you know, it was, it was still pretty funny to see how they were just – they were a thing for like a year and a half solid. And um, I don't really feel that with Milwaukee. It's just, there's something about Milwaukee that people, 
Well, first of all, Milwaukee's just not that interesting. I get it. Like, the city is not... It's just not... There's just not much going on with Milwaukee. Like, everyone's talked about that already. I understand that, but <laughs> still, I think you got to give them a bone here. So, yeah, you're right. It, it just seems like the tools are right there. It would be such an easy team to promote. What's not to like? Yeah. I I, I, I got to say, I've never been there. Um, someday I'll go just to at least check out the baseball stadium, uh, hopefully a basketball game too. It'd be mm-hmm. fun. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And, and, but maybe that changes, you know, especially, you know, if they're in the finals or if they win the title, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's so, it's so interesting that you hear this talked about all the time, like how the NBA or sports in general is just, isn't, it's not a, it's not the regional thing it used to be. And of course you're talking to a, a guy who grew up in the Bronx, who's a Red Sox fan and a Celtics fan. Um, but it, so it makes sense to me, but I think more and more it's just because these games are on, you know, nationally um, that mm-hmm. you don't have the regional affi- affinities that uh, maybe you once did. And you of course you're a big Steelers fan, as we all know, um, yeah, that, that 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 yeah. Well, the NFL has the biggest version of that, right? Because you get you get teams from all kinds of weird, wacky places, and you got fan bases for all of them. Like Buffalo's got fans, you know. Miami's got fans. You got fans in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I don't even think you could even do a minor league team there today if you were to start a new one. So it's kind of crazy. It's kind of the biggest fluke ever. But you, the fact that like you said that the prominence of games on national TV helps it a lot. Um, it's true. It's very true. Um, there's still going to be teams in the NBA that are very, that are more difficult to promote than others. New Orleans is an easy one. Like that, they're just never going to get any kind of audience there. And Charlotte's another. And what's another one that like nobody watches? Um, well, Memphis is a tough. Market. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Oh my god, Memphis. Oh, that's that's like pulling teeth for the NBA <laughs> advertising agency. Like they 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 just will have a difficult time getting Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't help that they play the style that they do. Like that's not contributing to the situation. <laughs> but, grit yeah. and grind. Yeah, grit city or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a good one. That really is. Um, uh, yeah. So th- those soccer, those markets are out there. But you know, if you're good enough, you can be a thing. I think even Sacramento was a thing when they were pretty good. So it's 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 gettable. But I do, you know, obviously, if there was ever a possibility of a Milwaukee, Indiana, Eastern Conference Finals, Adam Silver be running away. <laughs> he would not want that. But but still, it's like, it's a good enough team where I don't think that matters. And it shouldn't. So, you know, just that always just makes me a little odd. That's, I always find that a little odd. Um, did the playoffs take a hit because LeBron is out? Absolutely. I mean, LeBron moves the needle. But when LeBron was, like, in his first or second, his, his like second season in the NBA, he was not the biggest thing in the NBA at that point in time. So my point is that you're not going to get instant You're not going to get instant uh, uh, <clears throat> popularity with any of these players, even the greatest players ever. When Michael Jordan was in his third year in the NBA, was he the biggest thing in the NBA? No, he wasn't. He, he really wasn't until he was in his seventh or eighth season that he really became like the thing in the NBA. So that's that's another thing to keep in mind too. It's like these these sensations do not come overnight. The only one I can think of was like Magic and Zion. Like those two, like instantly, whatever happens, that wherever they go, they're a big deal. I guess that LeBron to an extent was too, but I don't remember. Maybe you would have a better idea than me. But this first couple of years, did people think of LeBron as like the biggest thing in the NBA in two thousand three or two thousand four or two thousand five? Like the thing. Like the biggest name in the NBA, it, was he at that point? I don't know. Maybe. I, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, there's some subjectivity to this, but I mean, I think what, what was his third year when they made the the finals and uh, they got pasted by the Spurs. Right, but, right. The first. But that the team finals. stunk. I mean, that was a terrible basketball team, and that seemed like the one like, where a lot of people found out about him as an NBA guy. Yeah. You know, he had. Well, to- I mean, it just. Yeah, it kind of legitimized him, you know. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh, yeah. I mean, because you come into the league with so much hype, and then um, 
you know, I mean, for being in the on the biggest stage kind of provides its own validation in a lot of ways. Um, and I felt like, and and in, in that case in particular, because that team was was really really was not <laughs> very good, and and the Spurs just destroyed them. But uh, but I, I yeah, I don't know. I mean, the biggest thing I'm just trying to put myself in the mindset of where we were in 2003 in the NBA. I mean, you know, he was pretty close. I mean, I'm, you know, you say Jordan was in the big thing in his third year, I mean, which would have been 87 if I'm not He mistaken. would have been a big thing, but, but he was not. He was really the, big, though. I mean. He was, well, I by mean, 87 he, he was. I, I was talking about the first two yeah. years, like 84 and 85, or 85 and 86. Well, no, but, you know, I guess he, even 86 because that's when he scored he 63. He still had his own shoe. Yeah, he still yeah. had his own shoe. I guess so. I, I mean, which was like Jordan. I mean, Jordan but you know, we're yeah, yeah. I mean, we're deep in the Magic Bird era, but right. it was all of a sudden like the story was really building about this guy. And, That's true. You know, he was a, uh, you know, he was a, uh, he was at that point even early, he was a marketing icon. I I remember people talking about that shoe, and of course, you know, days before the internet, people were like, "Oh, have you seen the Jordan?" And it was like you had to go to the store. Or maybe maybe you see an advertisement in the in you know I don't know Sports Illustrated or something. But other than that, I mean, it was like word of mouth about that shoe at the time. And I was in high school. The original Air Jordan was so big; it was like a phenomenon. And like someone I knew had one had a pair early on, and it was like, wow, that thing's amazing. That so is. So it was. It, yeah, it was it was pretty wild, and you know, of course, everyone else was wearing like Converse, right? Cons at the time, but like Jordan had his own brand. I mean, it was crazy. People must have ripped him back then, like I don't know about fans, but maybe like writers might have, because they're like, "Who's this guy? Like getting his own brand? He's only like a year in the league." But uh, yeah, I yeah, yeah, it was pretty weird. It was it. it I mean. Uh, I don't think we'll ever see anything like Jordan in, in a lot of ways, you know, it's right. just, I mean, it just cause, and I've talked about it before, but like LeBron is, has been kind of polarizing. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jordan is particularly early on. Wasn't that way when Jordan won a title, it's kind of like everybody wanted him, the bulls to win, yeah. you know, you know, it, it was, that's a very good point. Like I remember a lot of the nineties, uh, you had almost the whole country rooting for him at one point. Yeah. And yeah. I almost felt ashamed to be a Lakers fan. And Lakers were having some down years during those years, too. Like, 93, 94, they missed the playoffs for the first time since, really, since for like 15 years, it felt like. Um, and, and they were down. Like, even when they went back to the playoffs, they still weren't that good. So, as I mentioned before, you had the Magic were a thing, the Bulls were a thing. The Rockets were a thing. The Knicks were a thing. Like this is the this is what the '90s were. But when the Bulls were were, were doing their thing, um, I think the combination of that plus having a franchise no one had ever really seen doing things in the NBA Finals before, just suddenly just tearing people apart and kicking them around, um, that was definitely wild. And the '93 Finals, I really wish I could have seen that when it happened. I missed out. I mean, I probably saw like one or two games, but I just wish I was an adult watching that. Like, that would have been really great. Like, there was a game that went to triple overtime, and um, but I had never really seen anything that like that before, where like everybody in your school was like, "Oh man, Jordan! All right, I can't wait." It was such a. It was like the biggest national following I'd seen. Yeah, for and I- Uh oh. Yeah, or anyone had seen. Yeah, yeah for sure, and. I, I I think about what 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 you were just saying. Uh, uh, that's the first it was like, oh, the Lakers they haven't they won enough and let this guy win and and uh, I mean we little did we even come next. But um, I mean, yeah, it was just kind of especially if you were you know you're a Celtics fan, you you, you had no animosity towards Jordan, but. See, uh, for sure, but um, yeah, it, it, I I think it's like a, just a different time, you know. It's just yeah, I think you know in this era where athletes are under so much more scrutiny, <laughs> uh, Jordan would they really are escape that. Jordan yes. wouldn't escape that. Yeah, that's true. I I think it was it really was a different time. Like 
now, with, knowing what we know now about Jordan, I don't think he would have been as popular it, with today's climate just because people would have found out about the gambling and the way he treated teammates and stuff. And uh, Would that have been a problem for a lot of guys? I don't know. I mean, we don't really know until it, we actually were to have seen it, but it wasn't really that... It wasn't really brought to light, really, during those years. And I think the the persona of Michael Jordan as a player is uh, one of the biggest presences I've ever seen, and not just in sports, just but but in on the planet in that entire decade. And it was it was really fun. It was fun. Like I and I will be honest, like I was rooting against the Bulls a lot because like, <laughs> I was tired <laughs> of it. I want somebody else to win. I was just like, let's see somebody else win. But I did make a very notable exception at the end of that when the Jazz are playing. I couldn't – I hate the Jazz, and I think I kind of still hate them. <laughs> but I really hated them then. Um, so I was happy those two years. But <laughs> what, what was that, 98? 97 what, what and then 98 97? finals. 97, yeah. you had the flu game, the memorable flu game. It felt like it was That's like right. an Easter Sunday. No, no. It was like Mother's Day. No, 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 no. It wasn't Mother's Day. I think it was like Father's Day. It was some day. It it may or maybe I'm just misremembering it, but I remember that game so well. I'm like, oh my goodness, you could barely move. And he's out there scoring forty points. I'm like, that is unbelievable. And then '98, I remember being with everybody watching the shot. It was pretty. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, like you know, just getting back to what we we're talking about before with like scrutiny. Like LeBron, and I brought this up a few times, I think, is, you know, he's kind of, you know, he's kind of been the good citizen in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah, right. you, you can get on him for the decision. Well, here's the difference, he's Chris. He's a coach killer. Mm-hmm. But, no, go ahead. No, I, I really wanted to hear you finish this because uh, I, I, then I'll add what I was going to say. Sorry. Well, I mean, he he hasn't had the scandal. He, there, right. There's no gambling thing that right, we right. know of. He, it's not like he's out partying. No. He's married to his high school girlfriend. He right. seems to be a family guy. You know, right. he just seems to be like in a in a lot of ways he's like a regular guy. He's just yeah. You know, he's just kind of. I guess you know he seems to be really in touch with his kids and and so forth and um. Uh yeah, I mean and and Jordan. You know, as as popular as he was, uh, by all accounts, he was kind of a kind of a jerk. You know, oh, I mean, was. let's face yeah. it; he was no, not absolutely. a nice person. Yeah, he was not nice to very many people at all. Actually, yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting. We talked about that on a past show. We were talking about the yeah. golf trip and that he did with his buddies and how much of a jackass he was. He was right. just yeah, not not generous on any level, um, and and. And I agree with every bit of what you said about LeBron uh, behind the scenes. Like he actually, he's not a bad guy. Like he's not certainly not in the sense of having you know in terms of criminal history, in terms of infidelity. There's nothing. He's got a clean record. Never had a DUI reported in the public, at least. Um, and and that's unique. I think the difference is that Michael Jordan was about the game when it he wanted to win. The thing with LeBron is that he puts himself out there a lot. You see, that we I don't consider him a saint in this because he really does put himself out in the social media eye. And it is within his right, and it certainly helps his popularity. So I'm not saying he shouldn't do that, but I'm just saying he's going to lead himself to scrutiny because he keeps putting himself in the spotlight one way or another. Sub tweets this, Arthur fists that, or some comment uh, reacting about Magic Johnson stepping down from the Lakers three weeks later. Like, you know, you could have said that when it happened. Why did you wait until three weeks from now? Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, these are, they're not, they're not problems necessarily, just annoyances. And I just think it's just part of the package. And I think when he's rolling, you can roll with it fine. But when it's not rolling, then it starts to get a little tougher to take. And I don't remember if Michael Jordan ever had that much input with the front office, whether it was ob- whether it was explicit or not. But we know that LeBron has. I mean, all the coaching changes. Nobody can last more than a couple of seasons as a coach uh, under a LeBron team. And why does it seem like every LeBron team ever, or no matter what the team, who the GM is, or what the city, it's always the same kind of team. It's just like LeBron and a bunch of other guys standing around. Like, uh, <laughs> it's gotta, that can't be a coincidence, Chris. 
Well, it, it's a formula that that's kind of worked pretty well for him. So yeah, I know, I know, I know. I mean, I get Keep it. Kill for that. I but what the pro the, the only problem with that is when you <laughs> what is that the end result is you're going to end up with like a lot of nothing when he leaves, and so there's no game plan for like post LeBron, and every franchise that has seen LeBron leave. But Cleveland is a special case. They, they suck. That's a terrible franchise. Like I can't use them. But Miami really had gotten set back when he left the the Heat. I mean, I think the bigger problem for the Heat wasn't just the fact that he left, but the caps, the cap issues. I mean, that that was tough to get back, come back from, and they're still trying to come back from it. And you you broke that down earlier in the season. Like you know, Miami's cap management has been just brutal. They they stink at it. They were so bad, but uh, they need to. I mean, I I mean, I'm gonna use a Kevin O'Connor term from the Ringer. They need to blow it up. They just need to, they need to just clear everybody and just start over. And I think they would get themselves back. I mean, they did make kind of a run to the playoffs, but here's the thing, Chris. And we're way off topic. I'm sorry, but no, this is fun. I like this. Yeah, but with the Heat, they keep being just good enough to be within a playoff contention for an eighth seed, and I, I don't think that's helping them. They need to bottom out. They need to completely. I mean, I'm not saying that they should tank. I'm not saying they should tank. What I am saying is they need to stop making moves that put them in this position. They need to start trading. I mean, it's tough to trade some of these guys because they get just have the worst contracts. So I, I'm not saying it's easy, but they need to work on it. I mean, if if they were able to trade Timofey Mozgov with his horrendous contract from the Lakers, they can do these trades for whoever it is, Hassan Whiteside or or that other clown that they got during the off season of 2016 where everybody overpaid everybody um they can do it i'm it's gonna they're gonna give up some stuff to do that but the heat were set back tremendously by lebron's departure from the team and it didn't seem like they really had the right approach to rebuilding that so that's what you worry about if you root for a team and lebron comes and then like blows up all your cap and then blows up all your prospects and forces out all your young players that could have been the core of a like in like a decade of good basketball. I mean, you're not and that doesn't make. I mean, if you win and we win a championship out of that, then you're good. But if you don't, you know that 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 becomes tough to to met to the stomach. So that's sort of where the Laker fan is at with the, the that right now. Um, well, this that actually, if I may interject, that kind of leads into a point I I kind of wanted to bring up, but I wasn't sure where it would fit, and you. Mm-hmm. You you kind of brought me to it anyways. Um, I mean, you mentioned. I mean, one thing is like most good teams when they bottom out, they're 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 in bad shape all around. Maybe not necessarily cap wise. I, I don't know about that, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, you get a guy. There's like a there's like a vacuum, and all of a sudden you're you know you don't have the the skills to fill that, and uh, and your cap may not be that great, um, but it's funny you brought up Miami, which you're absolutely 100 percent right about. But if you look ahead to 2019, 2020, I mentioned that um, the Trailblazers were fifth in in total contract commitments um, uh, for for next year. Um, so the 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 team with the worst scenario in this. If, if we're looking at 2019, 2020 is, is Oklahoma city. Ooh. Number two, <laughs> number two. Can you guess who it is? With the worst, what? Con- cap with, space? with the highest amount of committed contracts Ooh. for 2019, 2020. Is it Miami? No. Oh, Miami's fourth. Ah. Oh, you just mentioned their fourth. I'm sorry. You, you did mention. No, 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 I didn't. I didn't. Oh, you didn't mention are. it. Oh, okay. No, okay. I did not. No, okay. no, I did not. Uh... Miami's fourth. Highest amount of committed cap space. After after the after Oklahoma City. I know you're leading to a point with this, so that's why I'm trying to think about it. It's like, Do you want me to just tell you? Well, okay, go ahead and tell me. Cleveland. <laughs> Oklahoma like, City has a hundred forty six million dollars <laughs> in committed committed contracts <laughs> for next year. <laughs> Cleveland has a hundred thirty four <laughs> million, and they. It's part of it is just that they gave out that bananas contract to Kevin Love, right. five year deal, Ugh. and he's going to be making twenty eight million, twenty almost twenty nine million next year. Um, but then just 
quietly have you know Tristan Thompson making almost 19 million mm. and that that was you know you want to blame a contract on LeBron that was one right right um, exactly right and, uh, and J.R. Smith who's not even on the team anymore is making yeah, I think right I think he's he has like a 15 million dollar coming to him and um Brandon Knight another 15 million Clarkson 13 um and then a few guys just under under 10 million owed by Cleveland so the, oh and and Larry Nance Jr's uh, contract goes up to 12 million so um wow i mean he was he made he made south of 3 million last year and it just jumps mm into the stratosphere but um but yeah that that's uh that happens you know you get these awful awful contracts and just i mean they're they're in horrendous shape yeah uh going forward i don't know what that team's gonna look like i'm guessing and, it and didn't like, work out it didn't work out for larry drew there is he still a coach i didn't even keep track wait, of that no they wait who is cavaliers coach now i should know this yeah, it's not him because I think he only took over for the remainder of this season. Yeah, and he's oh out. no, it's Beeline. Of course, it's Beeline. We oh talked yeah, we did week. talk about that a little bit. You mentioned <laughs> your. I, I I yeah, there's teams that I cannot keep up with. I can't I can't remember who the Suns coach is. Monty Williams. Monty Williams. Yeah, is I mean, yeah, it's a very coach. very convenient segue. I was going to bring that up. I, I they <laughs> right, hired Monty Williams, the Lakers' second choice. <laughs> really, the third choice because Kid was a second choice, but. Um, I mean, I mean, that's gonna be a very interesting watch for me because it's like, well, this is what the Lakers wanted, other than Lou. Lou's just gonna be on a, <laughs> he's gonna be in the Bahamas sipping on coconuts for the rest of the the year, and good on him. I I think he made the right call personally. People are like, oh man, Lakers is so embarrassing. They turn him down. Why would Lou take that job? I I think he was right to demand five million dollars a year, or five years. Yeah. He was absolutely in his right to do that. For the headaches that LeBron put him through, quite literally, he couldn't coach. He left the team because of the migraines. He's like, if you're going to make me go through that again, then you better fucking give me like five years. Guaranteed money. <laughs> I loved it. You know, I got so much respect for Lou for that, even though he's not a good coach. But he was right. He knows what's up. So, you know, they hired Vogel. We talked about that last week. Yeah, the press conference was hilarious. He's like, "Well, we're gonna do an inside-out system. I'm not worried about being the the being a guy that could be forced out." Blah blah blah. It's like, yeah, you're saying all the right things, but you know it ain't true. You know it ain't true. He's like, "Oh, Jason Kidd's not somebody who's gonna be an understudy." Blah blah blah. Yeah, you know it ain't true. There's no doubt that he is just an accessory for the eventual step ladder that Jason Kidd will stomp all over. To get to the coaching throne, it kind of is like Game of Thrones, like people just taking out other, each other. Um, I've never seen the show, but I believe that's what that's correct. Uh, so, um, wow, that's uh, that that's kind of newsworthy in itself. You you're the guy who hasn't watched that. I'm like the one guy that hasn't seen. It. Have you seen it? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the show? Oh yeah, yeah, I watched the whole series. Do but, I have that right? Yeah. Did I? Is that about? Is there that kind of action in that show where people are just yeah? It's you know I mean it's it's there's a lot of like human drama mm -hmm. set in sort of fantasy world where right. they're dragons and undead. But um, yeah, you're right. It's uh, the the best part of the show, in my opinion, is just has always been that uh, yeah, it's just about it's it's kind of a political drama in a way. Ah. Uh... Well, yeah, there's there's definitely political drama on the Lakers. We know this. <laughs> this is this is true. Quite accurate. Uh, more of hey, it. I, on, on I was just gonna. I was gonna ask you just before we get into that because we talked about Vogel. What? How many years did Vogel actually get? Do we know? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, let me look at that. That's that's a great question. I thought because was... Beeline got a five year contract from the Cavs. I mean, five years is kind of kind of the going rate. Yeah. Um, Did they give Vogel less than that? Because they gave Lou, they they didn't offer Lou five years, so they. Yeah, you can't imagine. It, okay, it says here from the LA Times, three year contract. Okay, three years. Three okay, years. wow, wow. I mean, you settled for that. It's a real settle. Well, good for Lou. Lou, Lou could come in there and be like, like if someone else 
Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so happy. Everyone else is getting five years. You're giving me three? I want a title. I don't care if LeBron – I want a title. That's a good pitch. That's a good pitch. Yeah. And if you're Lou, that's your pitch, and you stay that, that pitch. I give him all the credit in the world for that. I do too. I'm glad. Good for him. And, it, and we talked about this last year. We, we were like, is, you asked me, is Lou going to get another job? I said, absolutely, 100% he will. Yeah, He will get another job, and he will get another one after turning down this Laker job. Oh, you think so? You think someone else? Will? I do. Yeah, I, I totally do. I mean, uh... geez, I mean, how many bad coaches are there? Well, I there know. No, many... that's that's a great call. I mean, look, I mean, <laughs> that's a great call. I mean, I mean come... and there's so much turnover. What do we have? Six new coaches in the yeah. The Grizzlies need a coach. I mean, they're not going to call Lou right now. I mean, who are they going to hire? Yeah. I mean, who else you got, right? It's, no, it's yeah, yeah. That's that. No, I, I mean, plenty of rubble out there. Plenty of coaches that need to be replaced, and that will continue to be the case uh, for many teams. And Minnesota, you know, probably end up with a new coach eventually. I think they already did. I know that they did get rid of. Um, now I'm sounding like a clown because I can't even remember if a Thibodeau left. I thought he did. Yeah, that. no, they fired him, remember? Like yeah. in the second half, and then they, they hired Ryan Saunders. Okay. Okay, yeah. That's yeah, that makes that's right. That's right. Okay. Very good. Um but you're right. I mean, that's the fact. Now, um I don't think anything else came of the Luke Walton sexual harassment situation. So he might <sighs> wind up coaching the Kings after all. Like he may, may not be forced. I don't know. That, that's a I just don't have any more information about it, but yeah, I don't either. I don't know. I mean, I I would think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I would think if anything else came out of that, he's got to be. I mean, there would be no choice. Like, if there was anything I would, more tangible, I, I would think so. Just in our, yeah. the climate we're in right now, it sounded bad. It sounded it did. Bad. Yeah, it totally did. Yeah. Um, but I haven't heard it. I mean, news from Sacramento doesn't make it down here too much, but <laughs> news from Sacramento um... doesn't even make it here, and we're like only about. <laughs> 400 miles it's away. The capital. <laughs> We're inside the, the state. We still don't get it. <laughs> so, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's uh, That's just not, not much going on in Sacramento. I drove by it. I, I know this for a fact. I've been there. I I stopped in to fill up for gas. And I'm like, oh, man, you got to. <laughs> it's not a bad place to live. I'm just being a, I'm just being a fool here. I, it's actually not that bad a place to live. But No, no I'd live there. No, I, I, I could totally live there. It's a little cheaper. It gets hot. That's the only problem. It just gets hot. But so, but compared to like some of the major international destinations of the universe, San Francisco, even San Diego to an extent, because it's really nice. And then L.A. I mean, it's just no comparing. Like it's just yeah, totally. Oh, I mean, you're just you're landlocked. That's the problem. Right. If I live in California, I, I want to be near the ocean. <laughs> right, know. right. Even, I don't even care where it is. I, I, you know, I, <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to hear the you waves. Might, you might care. I mean, eh. well, in California, you get it pretty good. I, pretty much the whole coast has got some juice. Oh man, I love it. I, yeah. I've done that trip. I've done that drive up mm-hmm. Pacific Coast Highway more than once. Ah, uh, so good. Some of those small towns, I love it. Mm-hmm. One I want to see. But uh, we're. we're we're going. I you, I interrupted your point. You were about to go, if I'm not mistaken. You're about to talk <laughs> about the Lakers, and there yeah. was some news breaking some on news. Monday, Wait, simultaneous that... with the coaching hire. Oh yeah, yeah. So Magic Johnson, <laughs> we went on. First of all, he teased it in the, over the weekend. He's like, I'm going to lay out some big. So I'm going to lay out some big salvos. I don't remember what exact words were, but he's going to lay out some big salvos on Monday. Surely enough, Monday comes, he goes on ESPN's hot, I'm hot take. <laughs> it is, it is basically hot take, but it, but it's called first take officially. And he lays out all these things about how he wasn't, he, like he wasn't, he and Rob Palenka were on the same page. Rob Palenka backstabbed him. People didn't trust him. Let's be real here. Do you think people are really going to trust him the way that he's managed some of this stuff so far? All the tampering and blah, blah, blah. But it basically got into a lot of that. Like into a lot of how people would make decisions over his head and how um, Genie didn't really seem to just listen to what he had to say and nobody else did either. Um, it It's certainly indicators of 
of a uh, just a real train wreck over on the Lakers. And while Magic probably had some good points in there, to me, and I don't know, I mean, I haven't seen what everybody else weighed in, how everyone else weighed in on it. But to me, I feel like he was making excuses. The guy was just incompetent at his position. It really doesn't amount to more than that for me. Now, he's going to defend himself, and that's fine. It's within his right. And to say that he and Palenka weren't on the same page, I mean, look, you know, the the fact that he, some of the ideas that he had were, were pretty rough. And that trade, I, I, meant, I can go, keep going back to the Zubas trade. I mean, who was behind that? Like, that... There had to be some disagreements within the chain of the organization on that, too. So I don't think it's, you know, people are like, well, Magic didn't really say anything we didn't already know. I agree with the statement. But I also agree would say that this is just a guy trying to clear his name and trying. And I guess he's also trying to diffuse the 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 tension on LeBron, because I think a lot of people feel like LeBron behind the scenes was worth pulling the strings and he didn't really say anything about that. And you would think that if he's going to be laying salvos, he would probably go to that extent too, and he didn't. He didn't go to the LeBron angle. So I don't know what that means. I don't know. I don't have any idea what that means. But to me, the the, the, the summary of it is that he's just trying to cover his butt for some of these stupid decisions he's made in two years as the general manager. You, you can go back to like trying to draft Lonzo Ball over general. You know, like, who was it at that point? Was it Tatum or was it Brown? I can't remember. But, you know, or even over Markel Fultz. And there's no telling that Markel Fultz would have been as bad on the Lakers as he was with the Sixers. You know, you've really noticed that the Sixers have been just throwing all their young talent into the shitter because of their terrible development skills. They're terrible. They cannot <laughs> develop players. They suck. They're horrible. I mean, yeah. so I, I don't think that Fultz would have had his career destroyed if he was on another team, but the Sixers were just that bad, and they had their own problems with, uh, who was it? Not Brown, but it was Colangelo, right? Like Brian Colangelo and that circus. It's funny that no one's yeah. talking about that because that was a bigger, that was a huge disaster. <laughs> Colangelo, an that, that, enormous disaster. That feels like years ago. It does, but I swear <laughs> it was, it was within year. the season. Yeah. So that just goes to show you that when you're winning, all that stuff can get pushed aside. But the Lakers aren't winning, and that's why this is all being brought to the table. And my point here is, Magic has his right to say what all the stuff, but number one. He's under. If he says he loves the Lakers, then why did he go to make a point out of like undermining them on the day they hired Frank Vogel, getting into all this stuff on on national TV, um, and pretty much saying every bad thing you could possibly say, except about Genie, which is kind of uh, funny. Um, number two, he the fact that he's not in the Lakers anymore is ultimately a good thing because this is just proving the point for us, and I think you would agree that he just was incompetent at, at uh, basketball operations. And uh, there was something that, some growth of that. I wanted to add something to connect the two things. But but basically, um, the the idea that Magic just can't shut his mouth. And I told you two weeks ago, I still think he's the king and he's always going to be a great Laker. But if he truly loves the Lakers, he needs to shut up. Like, that's as far, I mean, that's as, pretty, as simple as I can put it. Like, you know what? I under appreciate your passion for the team, but and that's it's what that you had your say. At the timing was just weird. I mean it was probably pre arranged, right? I can't imagine that he just called up ESPN like the day before like, you know what, ESPN, I want to come on your show tomorrow. I'm pretty sure that was planned a little further in advance. And the Vogel thing kinda all just came together quickly. So, you know, I think that's a media fabrication that they both that they timed it specifically for that. I don't think there is any specific timing involved, to be honest. But the point is, he's just not good at this stuff. Like, you need to let your own organization breathe at this point, and uh, and let it be, because you just just enough. Just stop talking. I guess that's what that's what I want to do. That's what I'm looking forward to. Just just stop. Like, you're a good businessman. You've done excellent things in commerce, and um, and even in public relations, I guess to an extent. But 
basketball, operating a basketball operation, being a GM, that's not one of your strong suits. And um, the bigger mistake to me is the fact that he was hired in the first place. Because now you've got this big mess. And he's going to keep making, kind of like Trump does like with certain things. Like whenever something happens, he has to say something about it. And, and Magic is starting to do that with the Lakers. Like whenever something bad happens, he's going to have a piece about it. Um, that's not helping the team. It's just making it worse. He just needs to calm down. That's sort of my feeling on that. So ultimately, this is a disorganized franchise. And the Magic stuff is just him just trying to cover his own butt for being such a terrible, terrible executive, Chris. And um, a lot of people have had a lot to say about this stuff. But um, that's what I had to say. So let me get you. I'll, I'll get your thoughts now. Yeah, no, I, I uh, man, it's, I, I mean, I'm just... Uh, you know, it, it's showtime is what it is. This is like oh, your showtime. That. This is what, this is, <laughs> this is what we're seeing. Yeah. And I'm enjoying every minute of uh, it. Yeah. And I, I feel like there are guys I feel bad for. Like, I think Frank Vogel, like, is kind of thrown in the middle of this. And, yeah. you know. He shouldn't have taken uh, the job. I'm going to be honest. Like, I know he's desperate for a coaching job, but he shouldn't have taken it. Like, yeah. It's not going to benefit him. It's just going to be a pain. I think he did it for the money. He was just, he was wanted a payday, but yeah. he, I just, I think if he just waited, he could have gotten some job somewhere else. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, um, and you know, the fact that it's, it will be Jason Kidd's team soon at some point. I mean, it won't, you know, we won't have to wait three years to see no. Kidd take over this, this no. team. And You're it, right. It, you know, and, the, and what happens, man? Like what happens to the Lakers if, you know they don't. You know they they don't sign, you know Kyrie or something like that or Kemba, and they go back and they kind of have the same team and they they aren't able to pull off a deal for AD. I mean, just you know, I'm just speculating here. I mean, maybe they do. Maybe they ever, they get for him. And they, I don't know. They get another big player, but um, but what happens if things go bad again? And um, I don't know. And, 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 you know, and the magic thing is interesting because I, I just got the feeling like, you know, he really didn't really want to do this in the first place. Oh, he, the um, role rather the title. Mm -hmm. Right. But how does he have a job? He's still on the team. It's just like and he, he wasn't making bad decisions. I mean, he doesn't get any of the blame. I don't know. It, it was the whole thing was uh, whatever that show is is on. Um, and um, you know, he calls Polinka a backstabber, and it's just like, well, well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It, it's it's all very very funny to me. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm just. <laughs> Um, now, I like I, I've said it last time, last like nine times we've been through this. You need to not apologize. Do not apologize for this, because if it ever happens to the Celtics or the Knicks or the Giants in baseball or any of other my rival teams, Notre Dame, I will not hesitate to go LOL in giant bold capital letters. LOL the other team. You need to do this. I I'm I entertain it because they deserve it. They stink. This is this franchise is com it's a complete pile of rubble. It's just so bad right now, and this I mean I can't defend it. Who's going to be dumb enough to defend all this? They're just pathetic. They don't know what to do. They know what they're doing. Yeah, it, it uh, yeah, it's amusing. But I you know you, uh, you could shut me up totally if they if they go out and trade for AD, which I, I you know I think. Yeah, uh, you know, you know they're getting into the lot, you know, into the top four. You getting the four pick is certainly could help in that regard. I don't know. We'll see where we'll see where that goes. That's that's a whole other show. But yeah, um, very, but very, yeah, yeah. I, I I just I I wonder like I mean because I, I almost feel like things could get even worse from here. You know, just if if they have another rough off season. That is the that is a very frightening truth. It's a very accurate truth. Like it's a really accurate truth. 
Like it, I, I mean, it's very, it doesn't seem that far fetched that they could strike out completely, and they could go the Amari Stoudemire route and just sign all these mediocre players and then throw like just ridiculous like twenty million dollars a year kind of contracts at these guys, and this situation just gets that much worse. And that's that was literally the single thing I was most worried about when they signed LeBron. I was worried that they're going to throw a lot of money at bad players. And they're going to clear out, they're going to trash all this entire youth movement. Which, again, youth movement is a lot like NFL draft picks at the very front of the uh, front of the uh, first round. There's no guarantee that all this youth and all these prospects and all these highly touted players are going to amount to anything. But you still feel like it's a cheaper method of, there's a, there's a cheaper price to pay if it doesn't work out with that, overthrowing a lot of money at a problem, and then it's still not working. I mean, it's just an enormous difference from that standpoint. So that's always the thing I worry about when you go for it. I mean, you go for it. You should go for it. Like, he was the he was the biggest thing in the NBA when they signed him. I still think he is. I mean, we're still talking about him right now, and we're, we're almost in the finals, and he hasn't even played a game in the playoffs that LeBron hasn't. So clearly he's still a big deal. But um, I'm not faulting the Lakers for doing that. But I think they, I think they need to be more prepared for the methods for which you, you build a team around them, and this is just a continued issue with this franchise of assuming that things are just people are just going to come to them and they, they just have to set the table and people will come, and bring the ingredients and cook the food for you, and it's just not the case. You have to build a franchise yourself. You cannot assume anything, and I think the Lakers just. Did it again. They were like, all right, LeBron's going to come. We're going to be good now. It's like, it's not that easy. You've got to make smart decisions, smart moves, work with the youth if you can. I, I mean, I realize that's going to be tough whenever you have a giant veteran player. You know, anybody that has not proven themselves yet, that's a tough sell for the, the incoming guy. So I, I get, I understand that. But, um, Dave, I mean, just, just to get back to that point, I mean, LA is, I mean, could either very well can still be that uh, in LA. I mean, the Lakers, not the Clippers, can very well still be that destination. I mean, they got LeBron. He can still draw like a really good player to the team in the off season, and they have well, the money to do it. it, the, it yes, so, I understand that that all of the tools are there, Chris. Yeah. But it's not like these guys don't read Twitter. They know what's going on on that club and behind the scenes and I don't think they want to participate. That's the problem. Like technically speaking, they have one of the la- largest amounts of cap room of like of all the teams in the NBA. And like you said, they they all the guys, all the all the the dopes that they signed for this season are on one year <laughs> deals, so they're coming off the books too. So there's going to be a lot of flexibility from a financial standpoint. They had the fourth pick in the draft. And assuming they don't do an enormous trade, they do have some of the more exciting... You know, they're not... I understand they're not going to be superstars right away, but they do have some pretty good players. I mean, Ingram is the one that you've certainly believed in for a long time. Uh, Kuzma is a pretty good... Pretty good wing to have, whether it's a starter or a bench player. And, um, you know, they could end up building around... You know, they, they could recruit some guys to help... To aid with length. Um... Anyway, I'm rambling here, but but you're right that the, the, they have technically they can engineer this to become a pretty good team, but I just feel like these other these uh, prospective free agents know what's happening, and I don't think they trust this franchise. I've seen it before too. Like I know that when Kobe was there, that they tried to make a pitch to get Lamarcus Aldridge to the team, they couldn't do it. They tried to get Kawhi to come in the first time, they couldn't do it. They tried to get who is it that they were trying to recruit one time and they couldn't you know, try some really big player like I'm trying to get someone to play with Kobe, and then in the end they didn't do it because they didn't want to play with Kobe basically, and uh, I mean it could have been Aldridge but I might have been someone bigger than that I think um, or bigger than him. The point of uh, it uh, is yeah it was Aldridge I oh think. it was Aldridge okay all right I think Did you you know Aldridge winds up being a pretty good complimentary player franchise player no but. As a complimentary guy, good mid-range shooter, decent enough rebounder. I mean, he's he will complement every team. Like he's a very good complimentary player. But that's beside the point. My my point is that 
if you've got a good thing going and and people and there's a, a good vibe about the the people who run the team, I think t- players will be more inclined to go there. It doesn't always work out that way. I mean, Kyrie Irving, for example, that sounds like he just wants to do his own thing, and I don't think he's concerned about what the what the dynamics of the, whatever franchise he's on is about. So I don't think it would bother him that the, the Knicks are rubble. I think he might still go there. So I wouldn't be surprised if he did. But there are a lot of players that factor that into their decision. So yeah, you're right, Chris. I mean, it's I, I it is a very important point to make that the Lakers really are not in as bad a shape as they appear to be right now. But I'm worried that they can make this worse and strike out in the in the off season. And then we want they wind up not making the playoffs for what is this at that point, the sixth consecutive season in a row? I mean, at that point some heads are gonna have to roll. Like and I'm talking like they gotta sell the team. They got <laughs> you know. And they That's won't do it because they make too much decades though. I know, I know. And they make That's way too much happen. money. It's not gonna happen. You're right. And I think Jeannie Buss loves this. I think she loves being in this position, you know. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I think in the the end takeaway for her is that we didn't even make the playoffs, and we've never been more relevant. And for better, for better or worse, I think she can take that. She can handle that. But my point is, I think she needs to stop actually making decisions about the fundamental aspects of the team. She can <laughs> own the team, but she needs to get some people to run this team better. You know what I mean? I guess that's Absolutely. where I'm at with that. Yeah, I mean, that's why Magic Polinka was just a head-scratcher. Oh, yeah. Just- it, it, I mean, just two guys who had no experience running a franchise and, you know, just expecting things to, to work out. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for letting me. I was not, I didn't even want to talk that much about this, but <laughs> it's, it's tough. Like, when you know, you follow. They're making team. news. I mean, yeah. let's face it. If this were, if this were the Suns, we'd kind of have to talk about it, right? I mean. Right, right. If this were the- <laughs> sure that no there's no doubt like if it, <laughs> you don't really get this much action with some of the <laughs> their franchises if uh i'm trying to think of one uh you know the suns was a good one like that was a good one um if the mavericks no even the mavericks actually move the needle a little bit because dallas is a big pretty big market so can't really yeah. go with them but nobody really doesn't like the lakers because they're a polarizing franchise. You hate them, you love them. But whenever something like this happens, everybody's going to be all over it. And and rightfully so. I think they've earned that. Um, man, it's just it's just funny. I just... I mean, that's it. I mean, I I will be honest. Even when they were... When the Lakers were going through the three-peat and everything, I was like, there's going to be a time eventually where they end up being just horrible. Like, I know it's going to happen. Like... They couldn't be run this well for that many years consecutively forever. I think everybody falls in their face eventually. Every single great team will. The only one that I haven't seen do that in my life is the Yankees, except for when I was growing up. But have, since that time, have you seen them come close? Did they even have a losing season all this, all those years? To, to, with... Yeah, I mean, the last time they were really bad was... Um... You know, the Stump Merrill era. Yeah, you, 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 like yeah, exactly. Stump Merrill. Late Mel, 80s. 92. Or early 90s. Early 90s. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Since then, it's that been. That was it. Yeah, since then, they've been f- fantastic. Best, yeah. One of the best run franchises. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even if they're not being run that well, they still have enough great players to at least be a factor. This year, they're just flat out good. Like, they. And think about, like, how they've had almost the entire starting lineup on the IL and they're still winning games. I mean, that's, that's really good. So I got to give him a lot of credit. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, I figure that other than the Yankees, every other franchise is going to fall on its face. And this is that moment for the Lakers. I didn't think it would be this long, but, but I knew that something like this was going to happen. So I think after, you know, when it gets this bad, you can only laugh at it. <laughs> You're like, what? I mean, when does it end? When is it going to end? I don't know. I don't know. Hey, maybe they'll end up making the finals next year. Would you be surprised? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Or maybe they'll have the worst record in the league next year. Would you be surprised? No, I wouldn't either. 
It, literally anything can happen between now and this time next year. Yeah, it, the, and plus uh, the, the off season, I think, is going to be incredibly volatile. Yeah, this, this is going to be a lot of turnover, a lot of movement. We we have no idea what the league is going to look like next year. No, nah, that's true. I mean, we don't have any idea what the league is going to look like At in two all. months. In two months, like that's 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 frightening, but exciting too. Do you see any credence to the rumblings right. that Kyrie would rejoin LeBron here in Los Angeles? I, I, and I won't. I'm trying to. Um, so I, I can, I could totally see it happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I won't try to get in his head, but, uh, but yeah, I could totally see that happening, and it would, it wouldn't shock me. Nothing, nothing he would do would shock me at this point. And I think that's a very fair point. Kyrie is very unpredictable. That's that's a very good. You've kind of lend. You've made that. He's just Celtics fans are like really, yeah. A lot of Celtics fans are like really angry. Like, you know, he might go to the Knicks. He's played in the league long enough, and this is how it works. And he gets to decide where he wants to go. And um, I'll be disappointed for sure, but I won't. You know, I'm not going to be like feel betrayed. I mean, this is you know, people have to do what's best for them or what they perceive is best for them. Yeah. I don't, you know, I think he's young. He's young enough to not really see that kind of perspective. And I think of him as a smart guy. But I have to also think, I also think that he's being a little short-sighted with his, uh, with his motivation. And, and there could be something that comes out later about how X or Y and Boston is, is just rubbing him the wrong way. It may not even be the team. It might be the city. It might be some of the people he, he knows. or I don't know. But... It's it's always possible that that's the case, and and that's his right. But at least from a basketball perspective, it doesn't seem like this is a smart decision for him. Boston can pay him the money. I don't think that's an issue. But there's something else that he wants out of this, and I just can't decide what it is yet. But I'm very who knows, perplexed. You know? Yeah. Who knows? I mean, like LeBron. I don't know. He wanted to move to LA for his kids. I mean, there's all different reasons people do things, and. Uh, you know, it's not money. I mean, I, I think once you get past a certain point, like how much, how much can money motivate you? And, you know, how much can it make, how much impact can it have on your life? And what what are you going to do? Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it, like I said, it wouldn't, it would not shock me and it would be, a, a, we would have a fun summer if, if Kyrie went. Went to the Lakers. I mean, fun meaning me and you doing uh, our our summer shows uh, covering uh, the off season because it, it means that there's going to be a lot of a lot of craziness. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that's a that's a good place to to wrap up. It this is the nice thing about having conference finals going working playing out the way that they are. I will. I think we can can we safely put the Raptors in as a win here. Oh, they won. They, it's final. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I, I've been parachuting in and out of all these games. Yeah. So the series then is tied 2-2. And tied 2-2, could... going back to Milwaukee. Wow. Yep. But, I, I, but, but seriously, do you feel like the Raptors suddenly are, are a threat now? I don't. Uh, no, I, I still think Milwaukee wins this. But it, I, I definitely... Um, Coming in, I felt like Milwaukee would win this game tonight uh, just because I wasn't sure, mostly because I wasn't sure about Kawhi's status. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I'm, like, thinking, oh, maybe this does go seven, you know? I mean, this 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 series – I didn't think this series would go five. <laughs> I don't know. I, or, well, well, after no, games I, one and I two, I, that was a very strong – that was a very good prediction after games one. No, I, I, I thought it would go – no, I'm sorry. I, I thought it would go five. I, I didn't think it would go six. But um, but now you know it's it's the best of three, and yep. Milwaukee is the home court, and yep. uh, so I, I I I think I still think Milwaukee wins it, but I you know I I, I think there's a strong possibility goes seven. Okay, well with the, so that's what we're left with for the remainder of the week. So all of you listening out there, we hope you enjoy the remainder of the Eastern Conference Finals, and. Well, it's not been as exciting as the West. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Weird to think of a 
finals, an Eastern Conference finals guaranteed to go six and come out of that saying, eh, it wasn't as exciting as a four game sweep, but it wasn't to me. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of weird. It just, I, I, this is similar to what happened with the Rocket series um, against Golden State. I was like, but they're not really going to beat them. I didn't get completely in that mode with Portland because, number one, they were up every game. I mean, it was very close. And you did always have it in the back of your head. Well, what if Lillard breaks out of this and starts playing great? And we thought, well, it could happen, and it could happen, and it could happen this game, it could happen this quarter, and then you're, you know, the fourth quarter, game four, and then it's like, okay, it's not going to happen. But I did think for a while that he had a chance to break out of that. So there's a little bit of that. With the Raptors, they are what they are. Like, I don't think there's anything that's significant that's going to change in the positive. I think, if anything, things could change in the negative for them. You mentioned the Kawhi injury scare. And and I I tend to agree with that. So until I see some kind of threat from Toronto, meaning they go up 3-2 with a game coming at home to clinch, or they force game seven, and then they go up at like 10 points in game seven in Milwaukee, that's the point where I'll start thinking, okay, maybe the Raptors have something here. But certainly, if they get it done, it's going to be Kawhi's doing, because Kawhi really is the man. Like He's really great. So this is not a commentary on him. He's been terrific this entire playoffs. This is really about the other guys. Are they going to have enough to make it happen? They did tonight, and I gave him a lot. Of, I'll give him some good credit for that because it did. I, like you weren't alone. I thought that the Milwaukee was going to win. I think many people throughout the NBA verse thought that the Milwaukee was going to win the game tonight, but they didn't. And in fact, it wasn't even close. Toronto had a double-digit lead almost the entire night. So uh, from that standpoint, Toronto did show us something. But I'm not counting on that every game. So, um, eh, so you think Milwaukee's gonna take it, right? Do you think that? Do you think it's gonna be a straight up two games and they win it in six in Toronto, or do you think it goes seven? What's your thought on that? Uh, no, I think I think it goes six. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think Milwaukee wins uh, handily at home. And uh, Toronto is, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Toronto loses a narrow one in uh, game six. So, Okay. Yeah, then that's pretty similar. And I'm sorry that I've rambled on that too much, but, but I agree with you 100%. I think that's where we're at. Even with the, the two losses, I just still, I, I guess it's going to take a lot for me to change my feeling on this. But, just to just to summarize, I think Milwaukee's too good. They're too big, and in a, in a sense, they've got enough experience to really finish the deal. So, the one thing I would say that would give Toronto a little bit of an opening is that because Milwaukee depends so much on the three, if their three's not falling that night, then the Raptors could really come in and take a game. So there, that's what that what might open the door for them. But overall, one way or another, I think Milwaukee wins it. So we'll, uh, we'll watch and see. And I guess it's not all bad that we have six games, right? Like you said, at least it's not going to be nine days of dead time or six days of dead time, right? So we're guaranteed. When would game six be then? So let's see. So, yeah, Thursday. so game five uh, is probably Saturday. Saturday. Probably Saturday, okay. So yeah. so yeah, that gets us through the weekend, more or less. Yeah. yeah. So we'll come back on Tuesday. Decent chance that the series is wrapped up by then and we can preview the finals. I like it. All right. And maybe the Lakers will give us more to talk about. I guarantee it. We <laughs> will keep the streak alive. I love it. All right, Chris. Well, thanks again for coming. Right, it has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Have a have a good weekend. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Thanks for having me. You got it. That's Chris in Georgia. And that is our program. Uh, a surprisingly long show, considering how little we, we had for material but uh, we will take it. Hope you enjoyed it. We're back tomorrow with the PGA Championship recap. That was a wild finish. Do not miss that recap show with John and Mike and me. Um, you can find us on the web at dipcow.com, on Twitter, at dipcow, and on Apple Podcasts. We'll see you next time. Oh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>